Ho, ho, ho. Happy holidays. Uh, I mean, hello, wonderful person. This is Anton, and today, since we're very close to Christmas, I thought it would be a perfect time to discuss one of the most enduring celestial puzzles in history. We're talking about the famous Star of Bethlehem. Something that's obviously a holiday symbol, but also something that has been a question for several centuries. As a matter of fact, the idea behind Star of Bethlehem has been reported by theologians, historians, and astronomers in over 400 different academic papers and various books, with each of them trying to explain this in some way or another. And the central question here is pretty simple. Was the Star of Bethlehem an actual event? Or basically, a real astronomical phenomenon? And was it physically observed by the Magi as reported in the Bible? Or was it more of a speculation or potentially some kind of a religious writing meant to essentially symbolize something without having a physical event? And so today we're going to look beyond the legends, and obviously beyond speculation, and try to examine some of the scientific facts and scientific evidence, but also focus on one of the most recent studies by Mark Matney that was just released a few weeks ago. And this particular proposition is actually very interesting, but unlikely to be correct. I'll explain why in a few minutes. And so let's discuss the idea behind Star of Bethlehem in a little bit more detail and try to essentially solve this cosmic enigma. But to start, we need to first discuss the primary source for this story, because this is going to be very important, especially near the end. And so to understand the star, we must first look at its main source, the Gospel of Matthew, and specifically chapter 2. And the reason this is important is because this is the only source, or basically the primary literary account, detailing the journey of Magi, or the wise men of the East, as they're also sometimes referred to, and their attempt to follow the star. Now here the author is actually writing all of this in the latter half of the first century, and so he was not an eyewitness and was not even born when the star allegedly was visible. But he probably drew on some of the earlier sources and some of the earlier Christian writings. And here these wise men or magi, sometimes also referred to as Megui, were probably individuals renowned in the ancient world for their astrological knowledge. And it was the observation of various new stars that they then apparently used an endorsement of new kings. And so in the story, they traveled from the east, suggesting that they came from either the Parthian Empire, likely Babylonia or Persia. And for these ancient observers, the word star, or aster, encompassed anything that's very bright in the sky and that was not there before. And so this could be a comet, this could also be some kind of a nova or a supernova, or technically, it could also be one of the planets that suddenly became much brighter, usually due to some kind of an alignment. They often refer to these objects as wandering stars. And so in this case, by seeing the star in the east and seeing the object as rising, was a kind of an interpretation of potentially new king being born in a location under the star. Or at least that's the main implication from the story. But there is a bit of an astronomical problem here. In the story, the star basically stopped. And so the greatest challenge in identifying the star is in trying to explain his highly unusual behavior as described by Matthew. Here the text says the star went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And so there is a bit of a suggestion here that the star experienced at least two types of motion. First, it moved directly ahead of Magi on the road from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, which would probably take them approximately three hours to walk. And second, it then appeared to stop or stand still directly over a specific location. And this very bizarre and physical manner does not conform to any typical movement of celestial bodies, like stars, planets, or normal comets. With many scholars eventually concluding that this description seems to be outside of what is physically possible and is unlikely to be an actual astrophysical object. But nevertheless, in over 400 different reports, we do have at least a few that surprisingly do match some things, at least time-wise, or basically when they happened. And so over time, scientists and historians proposed several conventional astronomical explanations. First, maybe this was just a planetary conjunction. And so here we're talking about two or more planets appearing close together, such as, for example, Jupiter and Saturn, that did have a conjunction in 7 BC and was actually first reported by the famous Johannes Kepler. Likewise, a slightly later conjunction of Jupiter and Venus happened in 2 BC, which would also make the objects appear just a little bit brighter. But the problem was that while these were astrologically significant, they obviously do not explain the motion 
described in Matthew. None of this would explain why the object suddenly stopped overhead. Furthermore, the ancient Babylonian almanac does not indicate that either 7 BC or 2 BC involved any significant event or involved anything that was particularly noticeable, at least when it comes to planets. And back then, Babylonians were basically the masters of astrology. And actually, Chinese were also pretty interested in stars, but we'll talk about Chinese astrology in a few minutes. And so, if not planetary conjunction, what else could it be? Well, maybe a nova, which is basically an explosion on top of a white dwarf, or a supernova. And these are often very sudden, intense stellar explosions, which usually last for a few weeks to possibly a few months. And here, both Chinese and Korean astronomers did actually record a possible nova in 4 BC. But the problem is that Babylonians did not seem to have noticed it. Basically, here it's mentioned in the Chinese and Korean literature, but not Babylonian almanacs. And also, just like planets, these very distant stellar phenomena generally don't move in these very strange ways. They would unlikely to stop over a particular location. Nevertheless, quite a few different studies tried to explore the idea behind supernova and potentially even discovered at least a few remnants, specifically pulsars and neutron stars, that seem to have happened around the time when we expect all of this to take place. You can find the links for these studies in the description below, but here let's briefly discuss at least two such events. This is RCW-103, which is essentially a visible supernova remnant that's approximately 2,000 years old. And so this is maybe one of the candidates, except that we don't really know exactly when it happened, because knowing the exact year would be impossible unless it was observed by one of the ancient astronomers. But a much more interesting candidate is the so-called hulls taylor pulsar. This is an extremely famous binary pulsar system whose discovery eventually led to the Nobel Prize. And that's because the system that was discovered in 1974 was composed of a neutron star and a pulsar orbiting a common center of mass. And this became a renowned system for providing first strong evidence for the existence of gravitational waves, or basically it officially proved Einstein's theory of general relativity. And this was actually observed in a very bizarre way. Here, these two pulsars, as they orbit around each other, are slowly inching closer and closer together. And this is actually the result of gravitational waves slowly shrinking their orbits. And so here, by observing slight deviations and pulsations from the pulsating neutron star, directly match the predicted values from Einstein's theories, which was a dramatic discovery when it happened, and which is why these two scientists, Hulse and Taylor, won the Nobel. And so here, this particular object may also have the connection to the Star of Bethlehem. And specifically, this could be the progenitor star that went supernova as well, as it's believed to be approximately 2,000 years old as well. And here it actually may have been that supernova observed in 4 BC. And that's because it appeared in the constellation of Aquila, which is where this particular binary is located. Here, the Chinese astronomers describe this object as a fuzzy star, and so it actually could have been this particular event. But the problem is that, once again, if this stellar explosion did occur, it should have been visible to everyone, and it should not be moving across the night skies or stop in a specific location. And so here, the nova or the supernova explanation may also not really make much sense. With the third explanation potentially being some kind of a comet, for example, the Halley's Comet, which appeared in 12 BC and was recorded by the Chinese once again. But this date is generally believed to be a little bit too early. Or basically, the birth of Jesus in this case should not have happened yet. It should have been a few years later. In addition, historically, comets were often seen as bad omens and actually predicted disasters and not good fortune. Which raises the question of why these magi, which would have been pretty familiar with all of this, would follow one of these comets to try to find a king. So here it just didn't really make sense. But this does actually bring us to this very recent study that actually still explores this idea from a slightly different perspective. And specifically, this just being a very bizarre comet. A comet that could have been recorded by the Chinese in 5 BC and that may align with some of these estimates for Jesus' birth. And well, here, according to the Chinese, this was reported as Han Shu, a broom star, or basically a comet. And it was apparently visible in the constellation of Capricornus for approximately 70 days. Here's roughly what this would look like if we were to see this in the night skies. And so in this case, by using historical records, the main researcher, Matney, modeled a plausible orbit for this comet and essentially tried to explain the writing in Matthew by explaining the cometary motion as being super, super strange. 
In other words, he actually suggests that this comet may have approached Earth super close. And so in this case, he found a subset of orbits that required the comet to pass very close to Earth around June of 5th, 5 BC. And here we're talking about ultra close, basically the distance of Earth to the Moon, roughly around 400,000 kilometers. And he actually suggests that it might have resulted in a remarkable phenomenon, something known as the temporary geosynchronous motion. Basically, imagine an object passing Earth at exactly the right speed and direction to temporarily match and counter Earth's rotation. And so, from the perspective of observer on Earth, the object would actually appear stationary for several hours and even be directly overhead. And so, in this model, on June 8th of 5 BC, the Magi traveling the road from Jerusalem to Bethlehem would have seen this comet directly in front of them while it was gradually rising in elevation. And when they arrived to Bethlehem, this would have been approximately 10 a.m., the comet would have reached the position in the zenith and be almost exactly overhead. Here, the comet would appear to stop for approximately two hours. And because this comet was so close at this point, it would have also been extremely bright, possibly rivaling brightness of the full moon and visible even during daylight hours, which is of course when most of these ancient travelers probably moved. And so had this happened, it would have been an absolutely incredible sight for a lot of these ancient people. Something that would definitely lead to some kind of a religious experience. But that's of course assuming that it did happen. Well, here's the problem. This goes back to the original proposition. These magi, known for their astrological knowledge, would have unlikely to have interpreted a comet as something positive. Because most of the Mesopotamian writings usually refer to comets as bad omens, or at least omens signifying some kind of a major change. And this is actually exactly how the Chinese saw them too, and so most of these royal dynasties usually hired astrologists to keep track of this in order to predict any possible changes. And so at least based on those earlier beliefs, some of the things here don't really add up. On top of this, the more important question here is, why exactly was it not reported by anyone else? If this 5 BC comet truly passed so close to Earth, it would have been extraordinarily bright, potentially even rivaling the moon in full brightness. And this would have been visible to pretty much everyone, independent of their location. It would have appeared in multiple historical accounts across different cultures and would have created a lot of buzz way beyond just one single chapter in the Bible. Yet despite of this, none of the sources in the Greek or Roman records or any other historians around this time report anything. As a matter of fact, one of the more famous historians around this time, the historian Flavius Josephus, whose works cover this period, would have definitely reported this event in one of his writings. But neither Flavius Josephus nor the Roman historian Cassius Dio seem to have seen anything. And well, lastly, there's also the idea behind this object being so close to Earth. Because in order for this object to appear as if it stopped somewhere, it would have to be extremely close to Earth. And we'll actually have to maintain exactly the right speed and direction in order to match the Earth's rotation. And that's just extremely unlikely. This will be the first such astronomical object ever and would just be extremely unlikely in terms of statistics. And so a lot of things in this case just don't really add up. Which I guess brings us to the main question. So was the star real or not? Well, we cannot say with 100% certainty, but we can definitely try to make some conclusions based on what we know about writings around this time and based on some of the evidence from both Chinese and Korean observers. First of all, we know that this star of Bethlehem seems to be only recorded and mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew. In contrast, the Gospel of Luke, which also details the birth of Jesus, mentions neither Magi nor the star. Which means that the most likely explanation right now is that this was some kind of a religious or pious fiction. Or basically something that was used as a kind of a literary device. And this conclusion is supported by several factors drawn from some of the original source material. For example, the motion of this object is just kind of impossible. Except for that cometary explanation, nothing else really makes sense. And if it did happen, a lot of other people would have noticed it. And so modern astronomical candidates, including comets or supernova, are extremely unlikely to explain this temporary geosynchronous motion. Likewise, there's just a general lack of historical collaboration. If this was indeed some kind of a spectacular star, it would have definitely appeared in multiple ancient records in many different cultures. But since there is no apparent mention of this in Greek or Roman historical sources, it means that nothing unusual happened around this time, 
because someone would have definitely noticed it. But importantly, because the story seems to be unique to Matthew, most scholars today believe that all of this was essentially religious fiction, not a historical event, and instead was a type of a religious myth. And to hear Matthew's narrative links the birth of Jesus to the star prophecy from the book of Numbers in order to confirm his messianic status and in order to fulfill one of the prophecies. And so there's a very high chance that there was really never any physical object and Star of Bethlehem never really happened. And that's not my conclusion, that's the dominant scholarly conclusion after centuries and centuries of research and over 400 different publications. Or at least based on a lot of previous research, we can pretty certainly conclude that there was no one astronomical event that could have explained everything described in Matthew. The geosynchronous comet potentially explaining the motion just doesn't really make sense in a lot of other ways. And so at least for now that's the overall conclusion. Now it could have been a comet, it could have been a supernova, or it could have been just religious writing from the 1st century AD. And so until future studies or until we discover something else, that's all I wanted to mention. Thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining a channel membership that grants you early access. You can also support this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, happy holidays, and as always, bye-bye.